Well, good morning. morning. It's great to see you all out this morning. Great to be here and be together and to give praise and honor to our wonderful, great God. We are continuing in a series entitled Our Frame of Reference. And what we're seeking to do is to look through the lens or the perspective that the biblical authors intended for their readers. Now, we said before that we can come to the Bible and we can have different perspectives. And some of them, while they may be good intended, may not be the best way to approach God's Word. And so we're looking to say, okay, well, what is it as the New Testament authors or, or the Old Testament authors wrote, what did they want for their readers to understand? And so as we look at that frame of reference, we first said that the Bible is both human and divine, that God is working in partnership with humanity to communicate His Word. We said the Bible just didn't, you know, come out of heaven. It wasn't just dropped out of heaven, but it was that God was working with humanity, God in the Spirit filling humans to be able to write His message to us. And then last week we began to look at the idea of a unified story. That the Bible is a collection of scrolls from different authors, different literary styles, uh, different themes that we see. But they have been all brought together over a period of some 1,500 years. And last week we looked at the Old Testament. We saw that it was brought together or constructed in three parts. There is the law, there then is the prophets, and then the writings. And all of that together was compiled, if you will, over a period of about a thousand years. And what we see is there is this great diversity in the Old Testament, and yet this interconnectedness that we also see. Because it was brought together as it was compiled to tell this one story from beginning to end. And one of the things that we saw last week was that the the Old Testament had editors. And we said, we don't really talk about that much. But we we saw that the, the, the scribes in the Second Temple period were bringing together the scrolls. And we saw that, yes, Moses wrote the, the first five books of the law, but there were, we saw last week there are things that, that Moses didn't write that are in the book of Deuteronomy that seem like there, there's an a introduction and a conclusion that was put into this post-Moses' life. And so we see that idea of editors that they were as well spirit-filled to bring about this unified story. Well, now we want to look then at part two of that, and that is the New Testament. Have you ever had something, maybe it's a particular item that you have, maybe a watch or a, maybe a, a, a painting or a picture in your, your home, and, and it, it's very familiar to you. You've seen it all the time. I mean, you, you know, if it's a watch, you just look at it every day, you, you know it. But then something happens that changes your perspective, and you're like, wait a minute, how did, how did that get there? Or you look at a picture, like, I never saw that detail before. That can be us with the New Testament. We can say, well, I'm familiar with all the 27 books in the New Testament, but what I hope is as we look through it today, maybe we can see it in a different perspective. Maybe see a, a different detail that gives us something to go... I see something that I had never seen before. So when we think about the New Testament, it is a collection of scrolls of Jewish text from the second half of the first century A.D. And they are all written by followers of Jesus. And as we look at the makeup of the New Testament, there are a foundation, there's a foundational narrative much like we saw with the Old Testament. The four Gospels and Acts make that up. They talk about Jesus, His kingdom, and His followers. The Gospels are four different accounts that talk about Jesus' life, His death, and His resurrection. And in that, He is announcing that 
he, this Jewish man, is the one who has come to bring about God's kingdom into the world. That he is the fulfillment of the story of the Tanakh. That's what we said is the, the, the acronym that is used to refer to the Hebrew scriptures. That he is the coming of that Messiah that people were looking for. And what we see is in each of the four Gospels, there is commission at the end. It is telling the next generation of those who would follow Jesus to carry on and go tell the good news that Jesus is king of the world. And then there's the book of Acts that picks up the, that call, if you will, that call to action with the work of the early church. And as they are going out to carry the message of Jesus beyond the borders of Israel. And then we have the collection of letters that really gives us a snapshot of the apostles, of, of the leaders of, of the kingdom that Jesus brought about. And they're giving guidance and instruction to these groups of Jesus' followers about how to live as Jesus' is king in the midst of their first century world, that first century culture in which they live. And then we see that, that the New Testament is wrapped up, if you will, with the book of Revelation. The book brings the design patterns and themes that are found throughout the, the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, and brings it and projects out into the ultimate conclusion of history and what will take place in the fulfillment of the new creation. So when we think about that, and, and it's, it's complicated, and we, we ask the question then, well, how did the New Testament come about? And what we find is it's going to be a lot different than what we see in the Old Testament. The New Testament was written over a period of 50 years, whereas the Old Testament was written over a period of 1,000 years. And what we also see with that is that the, there are no final editors that gathered all the scrolls together and made, made edits like we see in the Old Testament because it had a different formation history. That while Jesus began his ministry in Galilee, and we could say it crescendoed to the point of when he was in Jerusalem, what you see after Jesus is that that large group scattered in about a period of maybe 10 years or so. It decentralized. And we see this spreading of Jesus' disciples. Just as Jesus said, and I apologize for the, the small font on that, but in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus is telling his disciples, you're going to go and be my witnesses. You're going to be my witnesses not only in Jerusalem, but in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so what we see is this, this spreading that takes place. And as a result of that, the books of the New Testament aren't written in Jerusalem. They're written in all sorts of different places. Uh, for example, Paul was in Ephesus when he wrote the letter to Corinth. And so on and so forth. We see different books were written in different places. <clears throat> Think about what that was like then. Just picture yourself as a Jew. You're there on the day of Pentecost. First time you've ever heard anything, but, but, but you're, you're convicted by, by what is heard and the evidence that is presented, and you become a Christian. Over 5,000 other people are there with you in Jerusalem. But then things begin to break up. I mean, there's a scattering. You, you, you've got to leave Jerusalem. You, you go out. And so for the next, let's say, 20 years, all you have is the oral teaching of the apostles and the Hebrew scriptures if you have access to them. So how, how do you know what to do? How do you know how to live, what to live? What, who is this Jesus? It comes from that. Over the next, say, 10 years, so we're, we're now, let's say, we're 80, 50 to 80, 60. 
you start to hear of these letters that are being written by different apostles. And they're, they're being sent out to, to different groups. And so maybe some of them might have um, 1 Thessalonians, as we would see it, or Galatians, or maybe even one of the Gospels, Gospel of Mark. The point that you will see in this is that the compilation and of the New Testament is very organic, and it's decentralized. But the Spirit is working to communicate God's Word throughout all of it. He is the unifier in all of this. Think of it this way. Let's say there's a social media influencer, and they put together a, th- or a, a hundred videos, and they send that out on their social media platforms that t- talk about what they are, what they do, what they're promoting, or anything like that. And let's say 40 of those videos go viral. And everybody starts watching them and everything, and they, they sort of rise to the top. And so that gives you a sense of, okay, this is who this person is. This is what they're about. Okay, I got it. I understand it. In a very same way, that's how the New Testament came into being. These letters are being written, and it is that people start hearing about them. So maybe one group had Galatians, or a couple of groups had Galatians, or 1 Corinthians. And then they hear, hey, did you hear that Mark, he wrote about Jesus' life. Or, or Matthew, he wrote about it. Well, no, I hadn't, I hadn't heard it. Can, can we get a copy of it? And so they, they, they get a copy. They write it down as best they can, and then they send that copy on to somewhere else. Think about it. How do you typically read the New Testament, especially if, if you're trying to read it like in a, in a year? We read it, Matthew, go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. We keep on going, right? First, first century Christians didn't have that. Galatians or 1 Thessalonians, which scholars seem to be, say would be one of the first books that were written, first scrolls that were written, came way before any of the Gospels. And so it was a much different way in which we view the New Testament than how they had it back then. There were other letters that were being circulated. For example, Paul makes note of this in Colossians 4, verse 15 and 16. He says, give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans. Probability is we don't have that. Some may say it was a letter to the Ephesians, but there's a bunch of letters that that are being written and what, the idea is that they, you can see this coming together. So manuscript evidence shows that by the mid-100s, so think 140, 150, 160 A.D., the, the, the evidence shows that by about that time, the four Gospels are being read together by different groups across the Mediterranean region which shows not only the spread of the word, but also the consensus that these are the four narratives that talk about Jesus and his life. Same way that the letters are being circulated in that same way. One hears about it, they they pick it up, they they read it. And so there's this drawing together then of these letters that are circulated that the Christians, the followers of Jesus would gravitate to, to say, okay, this is how I live my life. This is telling me how I live my life as Jesus is king. The point to understand in all of that is that the the apostles never got together in a room and said, okay, we need to figure out what's going to be in the New Testament. This is in, this is out. That never happened. It came together over a period of several hundred years of looking at, okay, well, what are these groups of Christians, what are they using? What texts are they using? And over the time, that time we see this coming together as they are being used in worship and the connections that they see in the texts back to Jesus and that the Spirit is working to bring about 
the good news. It wasn't until probably the third century or later that you start seeing the idea of the codex, which is basically taking all the scrolls and putting it together in a binder, like what we would say is a book. So for those several hundred years, they didn't have all that. Well, the question is, okay, if we got all these different letters and people are, are writing different things, well, what is the what are the unifying factors of them? Well, they're all about Jesus. Every single one of the scrolls in the New Testament talks about Jesus. Most of them talk about his death and his resurrection. And so we also see a unifying factor is the announcement of God's kingdom and Jesus' death and resurrection. Then we also see this idea of the authors are writing about Jesus from a distinctly Jewish standpoint. That they use symbols and themes from the Hebrew Bible to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of the storyline of the Old Testament. You say, well, why is that important? Well, there were a number of other writings that were being written in the first and second century. And a lot of them wrote about Jesus, but they wrote about Jesus in, in a distinct or, 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 or they tried to separate Jesus from his Jewish history. For example, one that you may have heard of, the, the Gospel of Thomas. You might say, well, wait a minute. It's the Gospel of Thomas. Why isn't that in our New Testament? Well, if you were to go and read the Gospel of Thomas, you'd, you'd see a, a distinct difference from what we see as the four Gospels. Number one, it's not a narrative. It talks about Jesus, but it doesn't talk about his death. It doesn't talk about Israel. It doesn't talk about him being Jewish at all. Instead, it's almost like a Greek philosopher talking to you about how to shed your mortal body and go into the non-physical world. It's very much in the idea of the Gnostics of the day who were trying to, to do that very idea, say, the physical is not important, let's go to the, to the immaterial. Well, people back then, they, they had it, but they compared it to what they, they knew to be about Jesus, and they said, this is not the good news about Jesus. It's something different. And so over time, it was discarded. We also see that Paul writes with an awareness that he had been commissioned by Jesus to preach the good news that had come from God, from the God of Israel, in keeping with the Jewish scriptures. As what Christian read for us this morning, Paul makes this point in 1 Thessalonians 2. He says, and we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Now, I would say if you, ask, if you got, had a time machine and you could go back and say, Paul, do you realize, do you, are you writing something? Do you think you're writing something that is going to be preserved for thousands of years and that is going to be God's word? I don't think that that would be a mindset for Paul. But what he does understand is that what he is writing, what he is telling about, is God's word as he says right here. Notice how Peter describes Paul's writings as scripture. Peter says in 2 Peter 3, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Now, we like to sort of go to here because we, we can really identify with Peter and go, yes, things that Paul writes, it is very hard to understand sometimes. But notice what else he's saying here. Peter is elevating what Paul says to the level of Scripture from everything else, to the level of the Hebrew Scriptures. As he says, they're twisting Paul's things just like they do the other Scriptures. So Peter's recognizing that what Paul is writing is Scripture. And so all of this 
comes to this idea of that unified story of God, of how God created and wanted humanity to rule with him. But we continually failed to follow him. And so instead of destroying us, God says, I'm going to work continually to bring you back into a relationship with me. And what we see is all of the New Testament documents then reflect on that unified story and how this comes to a resolution in Jesus. <clears throat> and how a community of people see themselves as the continuation of Jesus on earth. Think about it. How do we refer to ourselves? As the body of Christ. The Jesus followers said, we, we are that continuation. We are seeking to live like him, to, to act like him in this world. And so we see that in the New Testament. Now, we say all of that, and we say, okay, well, how do we read the New Testament? Well, for starters, we have to recognize we are reading someone else's mail. And I imagine that you could probably get that. If you came over to my house and you started reading my mail, you'd probably get, there, there's some things that I, I don't know. There's some background information that the authors, as they write, assume that the people that they're writing to, that they already know. For example, if you came over and you read my mail, I, let's see, this week I've gotten a, a letter from Hyundai, uh, I've gotten a bill from a medical insurance or uh, from a doctor's office, and um, I've also gotten ways that I can begin a credit card. I can start start my credit. Now, you don't know if you just read that. You don't know much of anything. You'd have to understand that. Oh, Grant's car is a Hyundai. And they're sending out um, the, the updated or telling you to come, come into the uh, dealership so you can get your, your uh, theft device updated. Well, you, you wouldn't know that unless you knew what was going on in my, my household. You wouldn't know th that, that, oh, wait a minute, you've got an 18-year-old? They're wanting to build their credit? Oh, yeah, here comes all the credit cards that are sending it out to them. Th that's background information that you wouldn't know if you just came and just read my mail just on the happenstance. The same is true with the New Testament. We have to understand that there's background information that we necessarily don't know. We have to look for it, which means then we have to understand the historical context. We have to understand that all of the letters fit into the larger storyline of God. We have to understand the context of the culture, both of the Jewish and the Roman culture of that day. Rome was very much a class society, which meant the upper class didn't talk to the lower class. Well, that plays a role when we read the things of the New Testament. We have to understand the situational context. There's a reason each one of those letters is written. There's a particular thing as Paul is, is, is writing, there's a certain reason why he writes to a particular congregation or group. But we also have to understand the literary context. Believe it or not, the way we write changes over time. Just to show you, I asked my daughters, Natalie and Elise, to put together a text thread of just a normal conversation that they might have on a daily basis. My guess is there is probably not 100% of us in this room who can truly follow every single word that is written there. Because I had to ask, ask, ask Natalie last night, I said, what is SMT in that third section? Something. I did get the bottom one where it says, see ya, T-T-L-Y, that's talk to you later. Now, my point is this. If we understand just in a period of, what, I don't know, 20, 30 years, 
we start writing things differently, doesn't it not make sense that Peter, Paul, John would write completely different than the way in which we write today? So that means that I can't come to the Bible with my own lens and think, oh yeah, this is the way it's going to be, assuming that that's how we write. Or that's how we understand. For example, the letters required a lot of effort and money. It is probable that Luke, as he writes to Theophilus, Theophilus was probably his financial backer as he's writing the Gospel of Luke. Just think about all that was required. I mean, he didn't just sit down and go, oh yeah, let me just pin this out and he's done in five hours. I mean, he interviewed witnesses to get their testimony. He, he started putting pieces together. That takes time. That takes money. The letters were designed to be read as a whole. And you think about how we typically will, will approach a letter. We get our favorite verse, you know. Oh, man, I, I love this, this one verse of this letter. Well, that's great, but that's not how it was intended to be to be consumed. The whole part was, was, was what was given. Paul would often write as a team. I think sometimes we have in our minds, you know, Paul, oh, he, he's, maybe he's in prison by himself or, or maybe he's in some, some room and he's just writing it all out and, okay, yep, there it is, and sends it off. No, he actually tells us in his letters, hey, I'm writing this along with Timothy or Silas or, or others. He He's, he, he has this team that they're writing it together. And they, they compiled their ideas, maybe poems or prayers. For example, in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 14, Paul is talking to Timothy and he says, Hey, when you come visit me, I need you to grab my cloak that I left. And also, I need you to grab the books or the scrolls and especially the parchments. What's he referring to? Most likely he's referring to his notes, the things that he had written down. He says, I need you to grab all that up. And what they would do is then they would hire a scribe to write these things down as they worked together. And then when they finally had a final copy, that final draft that they're all satisfied with, then they'd send it off. And the letters would then be taken by a, a teammate. So, for example... The letter of Colossians, it was hand-delivered, if you will, by Tychicus. And Tychicus would have been given instructions as to how to perform or read that aloud. Because many people might not necessarily know how to read. And so the letters were written to be heard. You say, okay, well, what is the point of all of this? And this is where I, I, I want to give you just a little bit of insight as to where we're going with all of this. Because maybe you're just like, okay, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you. You know what? We've already talked about that the Bible is human, divine. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. It's a unified story. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Well, what's the point of all that? Well, in considering all of this, it gives us a more accurate perspective, not just of thinking about the authors, but it helps us to know what questions to ask. For example... What, is, what do you think the fundamental question for you as you come to God's Word? What's the fundamental question for you? What should you ask of God's Word? Now, let me give you an example. Some might come and say, you know what? As I look at God's Word, I just need to know what does God require of me? That seems like a logical thing, right? Right? I'm a follower of Jesus. I want to know what it is that God wants me to do. Well, think about that question. Because that question automatically puts us in a point where we start saying, okay, I need to know what's right, what's wrong, what I should do, and what I shouldn't do. And we begin to start looking at it, then, okay, well, that, that means I need a list of things. I need a list of things to do or not do. I need a list of things to practice. Now, again, I'm not saying that that's bad. But I want you to think about this. 
One man says it this way. The Gospels describe, interpret, and apply the ministry and life of Jesus. Acts illustrates how the early church lived out the call to follow Jesus as the church continued to do and teach what Jesus did and taught. The epistles interpret and apply the meaning of the good news of the kingdom for believers living in community. Explore and explain the meaning of Christ for the redemption of the world and inform and motivate congregations to embody the life of Jesus in their communities. Now, as you think about what he's saying there, what I take away from that is the New Testament aren't legal documents that we pour over and say, okay, what should I do, what shouldn't I do? That's not how they were written. Sometimes we approach it that way. Well, I just need to know, what is it that, that God wants of me? So maybe a better question is, what is the story into which God invites me? Now, you, you will get still the same parts of the same answers, but you'll get more as you ask that kind of a question. Because it's not a legalistic approach to it. It's the understanding that God is telling his story and he's inviting you into that story. And that story is all about Jesus. And that's where we're going to go the next time. But the question this morning is, are you hearing that invitation? That is a story that God, it, it is of himself, and yet he's saying, I want you to be a part with me in that. I want you to live with me. I want you to live like me and work with me in my kingdom. So that one day, all of this will be the new creation that we can live together in. Are you a part of that this morning? God's calling you to that. If in any way that you want to be part of it, or maybe you've gone off the rails and you've said, you know what, I'm going to go write my own story. But you recognize the need to come back. God's calling you. If we can help you in any way, won't you come? Together we stand and sing.